I think that that adverse that adversity that she had in her early childhood is probably a big part of what motivated her to go on to such great lengths and to such great heights. In fact, it seems that that was a motivating force for her for her long and productive life. One of the first things that she had to overcome, she overcame jointly with her husband, Franklin, was when he was struck down with polio. Most people think that it was Eleanor that really drove him to overcome that and to get back involved in public life. He was, as, as people have often heard, he was kind of despondent after getting sick and losing his ability to use his legs and to get around. Eleanor became his eyes and ears, as people have often said. She got out and went around. She was active. She was everywhere. She traveled the world. She traveled the country. And she brought him back the news that he needed to get back into the political life, to be active again, and eventually to run and become president. She would travel to Appalachia and see the poor there. She would travel to see the tenant farmers in Alabama. She would travel to see the CCC camps and see what was going on. And she brought that information back. She was the filter that FDR used to make the policies of the New Deal, to drive us through the Great Depression and to understand what was happening to everyday average Americans all over this country, because she was the one that was out there and seeing what was really happening. There's a great quote. One day, uh, Franklin asked an aide in the office, well, where's Eleanor? And he said, oh, well, she's in prison. She was off visiting a prison. And he said, well, that doesn't surprise me. The only question I have is, what's she in there for? <laughs> and I think that, that summed up both her activity in terms of getting out and seeing what was going on, and also the fact that what she was doing all through her life was radical in many ways. No one expected a woman to be out doing these things. And I think the president, you know, with his quick wit, encapsulated that, right? It's uh, something in so many of the things she could have been doing might have ended up landing her in jail, where she's someone with a little bit less personality, a little bit less grace and dignity to get through those things, and, and also being the first lady and the former first lady probably helped her get through some of those hurdles as well and kept her from ending up in the jails. So when the White House, when the White House robbed her of the intimacy of family life and the time that their family could have just being together, she turned into a roving ambassador, not just in, not just in America, but all over the globe. So she took those those days and the, the talent she had for getting out and seeing Americans, and she turned that onto an international stage. She traveled all over Latin America, the South Pacific, Europe, everywhere that, that she could go to take the message of what Franklin was working on in the White House and what she was working on as she developed her own agenda, not only in the presidential years, but through the rest of her life. She was out there every day talking to people and experiencing the world and taking her messages there that anyone could be part of the solution, that freedom was something that everyone was entitled to, whether they were African American, whether they were a woman, whether they were from any country all over the world where freedom wasn't possible, where they were living with a totalitarian regime, something they lived through in World War II, but they lived through and in her life experienced something that animated her work through the Cold War and on with the United Nations and all of her ambassadorial work throughout her whole life. And she was out there making that case and giving people a sense that, yes, here is someone who is actually breaking down those barriers, who is actually willing to do things that no one else thought was reasonable at that time. Now, I remember when we were at Valkill a few months ago, my wife and I came down and toured the facilities, toured the national sites as part of our Fourth of July celebration. I heard the story of, of Eleanor living at Valkill after Franklin's death and how difficult it was for her to get the staff that she wanted there. She, she had someone that was going to cook for her, but she went through person after person after person who kept quitting as her cook. She wasn't firing people, but they kept quitting. And you're like, well, that's odd. Eleanor seemed like a very friendly person who everybody could get along with. Why was she having such a difficult time getting a cook to work for her at Valkill? Well, it turns out the problem was she would get up in the morning and say she was having two people over for dinner, and then she would go out and travel around town here in Hyde Park and go to the post office and go here and there, and she would talk to people. And every night when they came home for dinner, 15 or 20 or 25 <laughs> people would show up, and the cooks were so frustrated, they couldn't stand to try to make meals for these people that Eleanor just invited everybody over every day because that was her way with people. She wanted to engage people. She wanted to talk about what was going on. And then she wanted to just bring them into her life and bring them home. 
and that was what she did. And eventually she found a cook who she would tell them there were going to be two people for dinner. The cook would cook for 20, and it worked very well. <laughs> and every night then they had the right amount of food, and it just nobody knew who was going to show up, but you knew that she was going to find somebody that she'd engaged with that day through the course of her life, and she was going to bring them home here to engage some more that evening in dinner and in conversation about the issues of the day. So, you know, we talked a little bit about Eleanor's role traveling, but she was a voice for so many people. Just thinking about that, there were so many different groups that were struggling to become part of the American story, and she was a voice for all of them. For African Americans, she was instrumental in Marian Anderson's concert that was held on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And it was Eleanor that brought the Tuskegee pilots to the White House. She was out there fighting, fighting on civil rights issues before it was the issue of the day, but it continued for her all through her life to be an issue that she worked on. And here at Hyde Park, she worked with young people, people who were not, not able to do as much in the system at that time. She was out there trying to make a difference for them. She saw kids that were struggling to get into the farming life as farming was continuing as it has for so long to shrink as a portion of the, of the population of workers. She was working with young kids and they set up a factory at Valkill to teach kids the skills to build furniture and to find new skills as they were looking for a transition in life. She saw that economic dislocation in the economy and she got involved in trying to make a difference to help people who were being impacted by it. And last thing that I want to talk about for Eleanor, about Eleanor, is her work on human rights. When you hear her story, it was her proudest achievement, her work on human rights all over the world. She got involved in the United Nations in the late 40s. They put her in charge of the Commission on Human Rights. I think some, I think she even said that she thought they put her there because she couldn't do any harm. Well, it turned out that she did make this into a big deal. In 1948, they passed the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and it was the, it was for her in many ways a crowning moment of her achievement traveling the world and working on behalf of freedom for people everywhere. Equal treatment for people all across the globe and she drove that forward with her personality and her skills and got almost every country in the world that was involved in the UN at the time to sign on to it. But she didn't do that by compromising. You know, I heard the story of how some of the, the countries, there were four votes for the former Soviet Union, and they said, we're okay with this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as long as those rights just have a little caveat at the end, that you can, you can follow all of these different freedoms as long as you don't break the laws of the society you're in. And Eleanor said, that is not what this is about. These are universal human rights. And even if the government says it's not your right to worship as you want, or to speak as you want, or to work as you want, these rights transcend what a government can do. And she stood up for that, and she fought through the disagreements, and she managed to push through that Universal Declaration of Human Rights with her will and her power, her energy, and her voice as one of the first uh, truly international women in the political world who spoke to so many different individuals from so many different circumstances and in such an incredibly humble way. You know, the story of her just bringing people back from the post office for dinner at her house. I mean, this is the former first lady. You get into a conversation, you end up having dinner at her house. But that was who she was. She treated people the way she wanted to be treated, and she engaged them in a way that drew them into her life, drew them into her world, and she was able to have an impact on their life as a result. And so I think it's incredibly important that so many people showed up today to celebrate her 125th anniversary, the anniversary of her 125th, 125 years since her birth. And I appreciate everyone keeping her in mind as they look at the world and try to figure out what can you do to have an impact on the world around you? How can you right an injustice in your daily life? How can you draw somebody into a circumstance that may be different than what they're used to experiencing? And how can you inspire them and motivate them to work for a higher calling, for a better world, the kind of world that Eleanor spent her life describing, 25 years writing a daily newspaper column about how it should be, and the kind of world she spent her life working to impact for so many people, to leave for her children, for our children, for my children that are here today, a world where women and African Americans and people who are facing economic disadvantage all have opportunity to achieve and to move forward and to do better and to be included in our country. I think we've come an awful long way from 125 years ago when she was born to where we are today, but she serves as an example for all of us to strive to do more and to do better and to make the world a better place by our actions each and every day.
So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for letting me talk a little bit about Eleanor, one of my heroes, and thank you very much for letting me serve on your behalf in the United States Congress. It is truly an honor to follow in the footsteps of the great